Hey there, everyone. This is Michael Dougal. During this video, I'm going to share with you how to structure an assignment sale. So whether you're a real estate agent or you're a client out there wondering about assignment sales, this video is going to be very, very helpful. So we're going to talk about the paperwork. We're going to talk about what is an assignment sale, and we're going to talk about some of the cautions around actually transacting through assignment. If you do find the video informative, make sure to subscribe, drop a like, and let's take a deep dive into assignment sales with this wonderful slideshow that we prepared. Let's take a look at the required forms throughout the transaction. So I put here form 145 or 150. Now this is going to depend whether it's a freehold property or it's a condominium. Now, if it is a condominium, the difference is that there is an occupancy period. If you're buying, let's say a detached property on assignment, there's no occupancy period. You have your assignment closing and then you have your final closing. Next, we have our form 320. That's the confirmation of cooperation and representation, which structures out the commission. Normally we are going to have a buyer uh, representation agreement and are working with a realtor form. All right. What you need to know about assignments is there is the assignee and then there's the assignor, right? So the assignee would be the purchaser, right? And then the assignor would be, you can say the seller. And what's especially important is that you do get a copy of the original agreement of purchase and sale. So that's the document that the assignor has because uh, what's so is they obviously purchased the property and they have those documents because that's what they're selling to the purchaser being the assignee. Now, this is an example of form 145 slash 150. It's important to note that the agreement of purchase and sale looks very similar to your traditional agreement of purchase and sale. We do have assignment forms now, and you can see there's a specific wording. Now, what you need to know is that when you're looking at the address section, very often if you're purchasing freehold, so you're buying like, let's say a detached property, you may not have the address there and people actually leave it blank. And so this is something perhaps it could be especially uh, helpful to find out more information from the assignor as far as when the when the street name could be there and as well uh, with the legal description. But you can go with the deal. So don't let that slow you down. You can see legal description, having a frontage. So now we're taking a look at the Schedule B. This is going to be for every assignment transaction. So uh, just up until a few years ago, that's when real estate agents started to do these assignment transactions themselves and the proper paperwork and processes were provided. However, actually before about 2020, Lawyers were typically doing these deals. Real estate agents would pretty much stay out of it when it came to the actual paperwork. They were maybe the middleman between uh, the assignee and the assignor, but that's it. Give it to lawyers. Lawyers can figure everything out. However, now, fortunately, we actually are able to construct the deals ourselves as real estate agents. So a good listing agent representing the assignor, what they would do is they would actually have this information already prepared as far as how much money has already been paid in deposits to whomever they purchased the property from and the original purchase price in that document. So I'm taking a look at this here and I'll guide you through it. So number one would be the total purchase price, like how much you, uh, how much the assignee is willing to pay for the property. Next, we have the purchase price and the original agreement of purchase and sale. So that means in the original purchase that the assignor has with the builder, how much did they pay then? So we have here as an example, 800,000. Now taking a look at number three. So this is the deposit that has been made from the assignor to the original seller. So from the time that they agreed to purchase the property up until the assignment closing day. So in this example, we have $160,000. Now, when is this money going to be transferred over from the assignee to the assignor? That's what's indicated in this sentence over here. This is what's pretty common upon acceptance of the assignment agreement and receipt of consent to assign from the original seller because the original seller has to agree that this assignment is going to take place. That's when potentially this money would be transferred over. And next, number four, we're going to calculate this number by taking one and subtracting number two. So in this case, it's $200,000. Very commonly, you're also going to see that they add the number three on top of that. So that would be $360,000. Looking at number five, this is the deposit paid under this assignment agreement. So this would be the number that you have on the first page, let's say $50,000. And number six is calculated. This is the balance of the payment for this assignment agreement. You take number four, subtract number five, and that would be indicated on Schedule A or on final title closing if not indicated. Now let's go ahead and look at some of the common clauses which are often added to assignment sales. And then you, you can use your discretion and add them accordingly, but I would definitely recommend that you have a solicitor review clause, both for the assigner's sake and both for the assignee's sake. So what that means is that after the agreement of purchase and sale is accepted, you have a period in which you can review the documents with your lawyer. Your lawyer would give you the okay, whether or not it, it would be okay to go ahead with this deal. 
Why this is important is because very often lawyers are able to find fees, find particulars in the original agreement of purchase and sale that you may not have seen because they're often like 60 plus page documents. Um, the language when it comes to fees, it's legal jargon. Again, real estate agents, we are not trained to handle some of the things that we come across in that paperwork. So this is going to be critically important that both parties do have the clause for the lawyer review. This is for the assigner. And then this would be for the assignee the solicitor. All right. So a very common question is when is the commission being paid out? Again, keep in mind that we're going to have an assignment closing date and then we're going to have the final closing date. So what typically happens is let's say that uh, the assignment closing is only happening within a few months of the final closing. In that case, very often we see the commission actually being paid out on final closing. However, um, let's say, for example, the assignment closing was taking place now. Final closing is in a year from now. What would happen in that situation in most circumstances that the commission is paid out to the real estate agents on the date of the assignment closing? Now, that's important you understand, and it's better yet to indicate everything on your Schedule A. Schedule A's on assignment transactions are often three, four, five, six pages long. And that's because of the fact that the original agreement of purchase and sale, they make it such that every assignment transaction has its own complexities, has its own extra fees on top of that. Maybe there's development fees. Maybe you have to put a cap on the development fees. And so that's why it's really important that you are able to closely go through that. Pre-construction HST on assignments. So the rules with the HST seem to be changing. This is why it's especially important. Real estate agents, be comfortable telling your clients to talk to an accountant about this because the matters are going to depend from individual to the next. Of course, the rules are always changing. But what you do need to know is that uh, most commonly, the buyer would be eligible for the HST rebate and that they would be paying $24,000 on final closing. That is the rule in Ontario. So they would be submitting the HST payment. And then what would be happening would be that they would be getting the rebate. And the rebate usually will come by. They'll get the $24,000 back within three to four months time, sometimes a little bit longer. And it's very important that we are all responsible. We ask the right questions to the assignee as far as has occupancy been given to the assigners before it has been assigned? What is the intended use of the property by the assignee? If the assignee is to sell the property within the first year, that would obviously change things. Will it be sold after final title closing? Get to know these questions. Now, with respect to the closing, this is really important because the original agreement of purchase and sale could be stipulating fees. And now a lot of the fees are going to depend. And so you really don't know very often what you're getting yourself into. So what I do advise clients to do is to make sure that they have some funds aside for these extra fees because they will most likely come up and you want to make sure that you're comfortable and not taking too much of a risk here. So some of the fees that uh, could be included would be uh, utility hookup fees, carry on development levies, occupancy fees, HST again, land transfer tax, legal fees, status certificate. Now with respect to um, some of the development charges, often you can put a cap there in the schedule. So you can put like, for example, that the fees would be capped at $20,000 or $30,000. And in addition to that, commonly there is an assignment fee. So there's a fee just to assign the property, sometimes $10,000, $20,000 is pretty common. And that would be found in the original agreement of purchase and sale between the assignor and the original seller. So get to know that if is there a fee? And second, can the assignment actually take place? And third, make sure that you are aware of any other rules that would prevent you from going ahead with the assignment. For example, I've seen um, in some of the original agreement of purchase and sales that the assignment could not take place within two months of the final closing. It had to be before that. And make sure you are aware whether or not the property can be listed on the MLS or not. If the property has been listed on MLS as an assignment and you as the assignee go ahead with the purchase, not only could they be in trouble, but you could be in trouble as well. And of course, your real estate agents could so make sure that um, all of you people looking to assign your property, talk to the builder, make sure you have written confirmation as far as whether you can or not list it on the MLS. In most cases, unfortunately, you are not able to. And so you just have to really sell it through word of mouth, like talking to a real estate agent and circulating it out there. Buyers and sellers, do your due diligence when it comes to the lawyer that you use. You are allowed to ask them whether or not they have done assignment sales within the past, say, 12 months because their expertise can make or break the deal and you want to make sure that you're not susceptible to paying any hidden fees. And if you did find this video helpful, then do subscribe to this channel. Make sure to drop a like. If you're considering buying or selling, make sure to call me, call me, call me. And real estate agents, I hope you appreciated this video and I look forward to seeing you all next time.